Lexi and I'm with Lindsay, Natasha, and Jamie. And today we, both, we will be talking to you about stormwater management policy in Virginia. Um, so what is stormwater management? Basically, it's the process of controlling water from precipitation that flows directly from impervious uh, surfaces like streets and overflow from gutters into rivers and streams. And this often occurs with little to no treatment. This is a problem because when the water is being washed into our lakes and streams, there are pollutants that are being washed away with the water. Um, and this includes oil from driveways, toxic chemicals from construction sites, and household cleaners. Um, MS4 localities are basically what, um, how the different locations are described. So phase one MS4 localities are those that are more urban, have over 100,000 residents. Um, and in these cases, stormwater management has been enforced since the 1980s, but it wasn't until the last five years that phase two, which are the more rural areas, um, have really gotten much attention paid to them. Uh, in 1988, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act was put into place which enforced increased regulation on places that needed nutrient management due to high levels of nutrients, which can also be bad for the water. So we look primarily at state legislation for Virginia, the HB 1173-2014, which went through the General Assembly this year. Um, this was legislation that uh, was passed concerning stormwater management and the need for new requirements to be followed by developers in the way that they're combating stormwater runoff. Uh, this legislation has more fines and regulations and is dri driven more towards developers and construction sites and is more stern on implementing regulations to those phase two communities. So I just bro we broke down some of the history um, and major legislation and actions. So on the federal level in 1948, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act was passed, um, which was a nationwide management system for pol water pollution. Um, in 1972, the Clean Water Act uh, established a goal to eliminate toxic waste from point sources, so those areas that you can say, oh, there's a pipe with gas coming out of it, that's a pollutant. Um, 1988, I discussed on a previous slide with um, the Chesapeake Bay Water Preservation Act. Um, in 2003, the EPA enforced the MS Phase two localities, but those really haven't been enforced until about five years ago. Um, and that was just realizing that farmers can do as much damage as, as, much damage as developers. Um, 2010, um, the, though the Virginia is in the watershed, um, we had to follow more stringent rules um, that were passed by Virginia. Um, and then in 2012, local governments had to implement Virginia stormwater management programs rather than just by um, the state uh, as a whole. And then in 2013, um, the DEQ and State Water Control Board combined and were no longer under the DCR. And that has caused some issues because there's been a learning learning curve um, because the, the DCR or the DEQ and State Water Control Board haven't had to really manage everything as a whole. Um, so this is just a visual of what major non-point source pollution sources look like. Um, and that's what the HB 1173-2014 was about. Um, point source, non-point source pollution is the accumulation of pollutants over a broad area that are released into the water by runoff. Um, and these pollutants are created by a variety of diffuse sources and activities that occur over the land rather than in just one identifiable location. So these can be things like organic waste from manure and sewage, pathogens like bacteria and viruses, salt from irrigation and mine, uh, acid mine drainage, sediment from erosion of unprotected lands and toxins, airborne chemicals, oils, and metals. I'm going to segue into our policy analysis and our process methodology. Um, we deviated a little um, as a group. We tried to implement and incorporate a more pragmatic approach to our study, as this is something that is affecting localities all across the state. Um, so, um, 
Lexi touched on the regulatory overview and all of that. Um, Natasha's going to discuss coding and Jamie's going to discuss the results of that. Um, and the pragmatic part that we added in were local government interviews um, from those phase two localities that are now um, you know, directly being affected by the recent changes in state legislation. Um, we also have attended a community meeting um, and we're involved in the stakeholder analysis process ourselves to see how localities are educating their citizens on all the new regulations. And we also participated in a webinar that was hosted for local government employees that was sponsored by BACO and BML. And I'll talk over that a little bit later to try to see how all the state um, implications were affecting these, uh, these areas across the state. Um, just to kind of paint a quick picture for you, this is kind of the uh, bureaucratic nature of regulation. We have the EPA, but the Clean Water Act is the legislation that is guiding everything. Um, and then their regulations are trickling down to the various states across the United States. Um, as uh, Lexi alluded to, um, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation previously oversaw all the stormwater regulations in the state, and this recently changed over to the Department of Environmental Quality. So that's been a major shift um, in implementation across the state. And then, so this is all trickling down to local governments, that means cities, counties, and towns across the Commonwealth of Virginia. And then the trickle down effect to citizens, residents, businesses, and developers. Um, we did um, interviews, we picked two different areas that were nearby where we could go and interview um, stormwater engineers. Um, we picked one area being the New River Valley, um, and we um, interviewed um, staff from the town of Blacksburg and Virginia Tech. Um, the town of Blacksburg, we found, has been the more progressive locality that has done a lot of outreach and environmental education for, for many years. They have a stakeholders advisory group. Um, they've also gone as far as to have utility charges and user fees across their locality to absorb um, some of the impact of the state unfunded mandates. Virginia Tech is a very different um, animal in this whole game. Um, they're kind of referred to themselves as an island within Montgomery County in the town of Blacksburg, and they um, receive their permitting authority directly from the state. Um, so anything that they do is reviewed directly by DEQ. Um, where it is a little different than the town of Blacksburg is the town of Blacksburg has incorporated more stringent regulations than the state, which is something that's allowed by the state code. Um, so any of the residents or developers coming in the town of Blacksburg to do projects have more strict requirements than what the state requires. Um, this is particularly troublesome when the town of Blacksburg or Virginia Tech are trying to get joint projects. Because they have a few grants, and uh, typically they would go by default to the state regulations, uh, because Virginia State uh, Tech is a state entity, but since the town of Blacksburg has stricter requirements, they have to go by those. Um, and then just Montgomery County, we didn't interview them, but they are a brand new um, MS4 locality, so they're going through all of the new hoops and trying to understand how it's affecting their citizens now. We also focused on the Roanoke Valley. We conducted interviews with uh, stormwater engineers from Roanoke City and Roanoke County. Um, Roanoke City it has more strict requirements than the county right now. Uh, one thing that we noticed and heard from this is how it's affecting a kind of competition between for economic development projects in the Roanoke Valley. Um, the city is more strict in the state. Uh, Roanoke County, actually, their board of supervisors just passed, passed an ordinance to allow um, for development to go along with the state requirements. So they're actually less strict than Roanoke City. So we're going to have to watch and see how that plays out um, in the development field. Um, and also, Roanoke County was unique in that the town of Benton is located within um, that jurisdiction, and they are, they have a joint uh, memorandum of agreement to um, consolidate some of their enforcement and review reviews. Um, they also were in the process of doing a stormwater advisory committee, and that was the community meeting that we attended um, during this process. The webinar um, that was titled Staying Afloat in Stormwater Surge, it was hosted by Bacon and BML, which is the Virginia Association of Counties and the Virginia Municipal League. They're more lobbying groups for local governments. Um, and it was also hosted by Virginia Tech, the land use education program here. Um, and it was really focused on and guided towards local government implementation. So this was something that was developed to help localities um, make a decision as to whether or not they were going to opt in or opt out of the state regulations. Um, previous guidance from the 2012 legislation required localities um, to opt in to the uh, legislation so they had to develop a stormwater management program. Um, now there's an option that localities, this was just passed in March, which has been affecting all the localities who have budgets that are coming away and, and they're in preparation for the July 4th fiscal year deadline. Um, and as early as this past March, um, there were some tweaks to the legislation that allow localities to opt out. And so they have to notify DEQ if they're not going to create their own in, um, stormwater management program in-house, that they can rely default back to DEQ if they choose. So 
So just in summary, some of the local government um, policy shortcomings that we that we identified, we've covered most of these. But the state, state oversight and management shifts from DCR to DQ were very prominent, and um, we were here to learn a lot about that. And the policy adoption and implementation timeframes with legislation being as to provisions occurring as late as March um, it makes it very difficult for localities to get in front of their board of supervisors or city councils to get ordinances adopted to meet um, DEQ's July 1st um, implementation deadline. Also, the issue of unfunded state mandates. The localities are not receiving any additional funds to um, incorporate these <coughs> programs. Um, there's been questions about enforcement and penalties and how the courts are going to respond or is DEQ going to uh, fine localities if they are making incremental steps to implement the programs in their localities but maybe not meeting the state mandates. <laughs> Um, the issue of stream impairments and total maximum daily loads was discussed. Just general technical guidance, DEQ, um, a, we heard in the webinar, there's a lot of uh, gray areas and muddy areas within the state legislation that um, localities are requesting guidance from. Just the issue of staff resources, we've discussed um, economic development issues, um, public education and outreach um, that localities are having to do as part of their programs, and of course the agricultural exemptions and the whole polluted pie and the, you know, agricultural uses upstream are impacting the downstream um, pollutants and they are not currently required to um, do any uh, mitigation measures. So, I'm going to switch over to you. So, just very quickly, um, we uh, coded a total of 16 Virginia newspaper articles which were extracted from um, LexisNexis um, and Google Scholar. Um, in terms of interpreter reliability, we had a 94% accuracy rate. Um, I can't see the cursor. <laughs>
coded this, um, we looked at their personal narratives, and for us, we defined it as an actual quote um, from someone, and it was often politicians and government officials that were quoted, and we just assumed this is because of their position authority. People are going to trust what they're saying. Um, also, we saw it was an entrepreneurial um, cost-benefit, I guess, overview. Um, concentrated costs, like Lexi mentioned earlier, mostly fell on the developers because of the higher permit fees and such, um, but diffuse benefits that everyone's going to have greater you know, quality of life because the environment's cleaner and all that. The plot uh, was kind of a combination of both. One of it was um, the slowing of progress just because if your environment isn't good, then your locality isn't good, so we're going to fix it and hopefully continue to progress. And it was also the story of control because it was coming down from the state to locality on who's willing to control, who's trying to fix the situation. Um, and we also saw that the causes were both accidental and inadvertent on a larger scale, just the nature causes because nature kind of, there's erosion and all that stuff that you can't help, but also progress through more infrastructure um, and things like that, that you have these inadvertent causes because of, you know, urbanization and that kind of thing. Moral of the story, there was pretty much a policy solution um, in most of the articles, and the solution was that we are going to implement these new regulations, but we're looking to delay it. Um, that's kind of to help businesses, constituents, developers, all that, get their feet up under them so that they can pay for these higher fees. Um, and like I said, we have the entrepreneurial cost benefits, so that tied into the moral of the story as well. Power also had a combination of both coercion and persuasion. Um, coercion because you have to pay these fees if you want to develop and all that stuff, but also persuasion because of the larger good feeling that you're helping the environment and thus helping your locality. Um, I found when we were going through and doing this that when it came from the local government perspective, it seemed to have a post-positive um, approach and that they wanted to assist their constituents um, by delaying this action and they also wanted to educate the public. Here's what's going on and here's what we're trying to do to fix it. But when it came to the state government, which we didn't focus on as much, but we often saw in our articles, it was more of a rational approach. That we are doing this to help everybody, and yes, there's going to be consequences, but it's for the good of y'all. Um, the ends are driving the means, and with them making the decisions, it was an elitist approach and not really getting the public involved. <coughs> Lastly, the implication for public administrators. Um, on a broad scale, we all know that perception is reality, and that's part of the reason why narrative policy framework is so important, um, how you're projecting these policy shifts is how your citizens are going to view it. It's not so much what you're doing, but how they perceive it. Um, so when it came down to stormwater regulation, the narrative seemed to include all three characters, heroes, villains, victims, um, often with quotes from political leaders and elected officials, and there had to be a policy solution that was offered, um, and then of course the plots that were included, mostly you know, slowing progress, but also the story of control. Are there any questions or comments? Well, okay, I'll start. First, um, the bit at the end, rational, post positive, nice touch, nobody else did that like that. Power codes, cool. Co coding persuasion and digital code manipulation. We actually didn't code it. It was just because we only had 16 articles. It was pretty easy to get a clear picture of them. Um, so it wasn't actually a code, just what we found at the end of everything. That that was pretty much the story or how they wielded their power in those ways. Very so we didn't cool. And linked to the policy solution, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should remember that, Holly. Very cool code. Mm -hmm. And now there's not a cool code. Um, <laughs> so it almost seemed like two different presentations. You have the front end, the lit review, and you know you did these cool interviews, you watched this webinar, and then you did this different thing where you coded 16 articles. Make that connection for me. For us, I think it's safe to say we didn't really know much about stormwater regulation. So part of all that background was just to create a clear picture for us. And then through the coding, because we had this background, it created this bigger picture of stormwater regulation. Um, how it's affecting the localities, not just in the articles that we read, but because we attended these webinars or we were looking at the legislation. Um, so for us, the narrative was much more than just the coding that we did on those 16 articles, but all these other avenues that we ventured into to try to get a holistic picture of what was going on. 
Can you make can you make any connection at this point between the, the interviews and the and the articles? I mean, there's similarities, differences. One thing that I think was a little bit troublesome during this was that we started with you know our one like perspective. We're going to do the interviews and do the coding, and then legislation changed midway through, and so a lot of the media articles that we had originally researched were now kind of. Uh, no, I don't know if that's the right word. But it didn't apply. They didn't really apply after that because so much had changed. And so now we kind of had to shift gears to, okay, now how are the local counties responding to the new state legislation? And that kind of shifted our focus a little. And I'm not sure that's answering your question directly. But um, so I guess in all, we were kind of judging the way the new legislation <coughs> changes fell down to localities and were they happy with those? Were there still areas of, you know, ambiguity? And so but the, the purpose see. of the interviews was to extract the stormwater narrative. To be informed about yes and no. I don't want to step on Lindsay's toes because she did the interviews, but I think for us, through our coding, we realized that localities, I don't want to say we're unhappy, but they were struggling to match the state's demands. And so when we did the interviews and we were talking to these professionals who were actually involved in the industry and really feeling the effects, it kind of reaffirmed what we were already reading. Um, so it was partly to add to the story for us, but it also matched what we were already finding when we were coding articles. And it wasn't just a media perspective, but these industry professionals who were very aware and cognizant of what was happening to them or in their industry. And, and BACO and BML, I, I think, were successful in lobbying to the state and getting the revisions that came out in March. So I thought that was something that was very telling, that localities all across the state identified all these different issues. Hey, wait, wait, state, we can't do this in this time frame. And as a result of that and all the media attention and the coding, the legislation was changed. And there still are some issues in the legislation that need to be worked out, but by and large, the localities are, are much happier with the March legislative changes. Well, overall, very comprehensive. I can tell you guys that it's kind of work here. So I'll sit back and let other people ask questions. <laughs> Did you consider coding the interviews? We did consider that. Um, we had some technical <laughs> issues. We did try yeah. to uh, actually uh, to record, record the there. first interview, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the localities were uh, wanted to, to speak more candidly off the record. Mm -hmm.